As the global interest in mushrooms continues to grow, regional mushroom festivals are not only a celebration of the diversity and wonder of fungi, but also a key part of changing how society views their potential, whether it's for food, medicine, ecology, or even community building. We're thrilled to have two incredible guests tonight, each contributing to this movement in their own unique way. First, we'll hear from Leland Gordon, a local gourmet mushroom farmer from Akron, Ohio, will be conducting beginner workshops on cordyceps cultivation at the Ohio Mushroom Festival. Leland's hands-on approach to cultivation is perfect for anybody looking to deepen their knowledge or start their journey into mushroom farming. Our featured guest is none other than Peter McCoy, author of Radical Mycology and founder of Rad Myco, a biennial event that brings together people from all walks of life to celebrate the human-fungal relationship. Peter has been at the forefront of the mycology movement, and his work continues to inspire new generations of mycophiles. Red Myco is more than just a festival. It's a community. It's a celebration and a movement that highlights the essential role fungi play in our lives. Join us as we explore how these festivals are fostering a greater connection to fungi and their transformative potential for our health, environment, and our culture. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and we got a great show for you tonight, guys. We're going to hang out with some cool people. Yes, we're going to. Yes, we're going to. All right, we got a shout out. Uh, I finally got them. Finally got the uh, the 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 summer deck right here. Stealthy spores got me the summer deck. Bam! Let's take a look at what we got in here. All right, what we got? What we got? What we got? All right, we got oh a couple of the buddies. Okay, cool. All right, we got natural state mycology card. Check it out. Natural state mycology. Yes, yes, yes. And he's got some cultigen cards in here too. Man. Natural state really is in the lab doing microscopy, guys. Uh, look at this. He's got three cards. Of course, we got, let's get these. Of course, we got Dirty Sanchez. We got Creature. We got Scuba Steve. I love it. That's awesome. Also, the homie uh, from Canada, Mushman 9000, the man, the myth, the legend. Shout out to Mushman9000, one of my favorite people on earth. Another really cool guy, John Allen. Uh, John Allen said he was getting off Facebook. I hope not, because I, I love getting comments from John Allen. I love being able to ask him a question here and there. Um, if you guys don't know who John Allen is, you know, just go look him up. You got Google. Come on, guys, don't be lazy. All right, and then finally, look at that. What we got here? Come on. Ladies of Mycology Facebook group. Shout out to the Myco Mama. Shout out to Missy Myco. Shout out to Susie Greenberg. You guys uh, put together really a great Facebook group for women. Good for you guys. All right. Anyway, stealthysports.com, promo code geeky. Although I think right now he's got a killer sale going on. So uh, if you guys have been holding out, waiting for a good, good sale, I think this is the time. Go check it out, stealthysports.com. Get you some playing cards. We can play at the Ohio Mushroom Festival. I'll be bringing my decks ready to go. All right, guys, so speaking of that, Ohio Mushroom Festival this weekend, September 12th through the 15th at Joe Bottoms Campground in Hammondsville, Ohio. Tickets still available. Um, I didn't buy them all, so you guys can still come. Please come, hang out. It'll be a good time. They got, you know, guided forays, workshops, lectures, cooking demos, yoga, kids' activities, crafts, food trucks. They got it all. And then who's going to be there? Oh, just a couple people. Alan Rockefeller, Walt Sturgeon, Don King, John Plischke, Rob Chen, James Mann. Oh, my God. Can I name all these people? I, 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 I'm I, not going to. A lot, a lot of people. My buddy Kyle's going to be there on Sunday. Uh, my buddy Leland, who we're about to get to know and talk to, he's going to be doing uh, some workshops. 
yeah, it's going to be a good time. Come hang out. All right. So uh, tonight's theme, we're, we're talking about mushroom festivals. Uh, they're fun. You get to hang out with a lot of people. Um, we're going we're gonna to sit down here in a second with Leland. We're going to get to know him a little bit and find out uh, what he's going to be at the, doing at the Ohio Mushroom Festival. And then after that, we're going to talk to the one and only Peter McCoy. Man, was that a good interview. I cannot wait to get into it. All right. So first off, let's, let's get to know my buddy. One of my neighbors lives down just down the road a little ways. Um, Leland Gordon. On the west side of Akron, the spore store's Leland Gordon has perfected gourmet mushroom cultivation and even cracked the code on the perfect mushroom coffee. Tonight, Mike O'Geeky sits down with Leland to discuss his involvement in the upcoming Ohio Mushroom Festival running September 12th through the 15th in Hammondsville, Ohio. Leland will be leading hands-on workshops to get interested participants of the festival started with growing their own cordyceps mushrooms. Follow the Spore Store on Instagram for updates and more information. All right, man. So uh, it's great to be here. I mean, I'm in the backyard of Leland Gordon. He he's uh, somewhat of a neighbor for me. Uh, we get to hang out a little bit, but for the most part, we're both busy guys. We got a lot going on, so we don't get to do this too often. So I'm really excited to sit down with him. Um, so Leland, talk to me. You're going to be at the Ohio Mushroom Festival. Yep. Um, you're going to give a talk on what now? Cordyceps, cordyceps okay. cultivation, some home techniques, uh, things to kind of go over, some do's and don'ts, um, kind of get people set up for successful growing at home rather than, um, you know, mass production or anything like that, but um, get people to be able to grow cordyceps at home successfully um, and good quality ones at that, so. Ooh, good quality. Okay, I like that. Um, I have yet to give cordyceps a try. Yeah. I think I'm scared. I'm not going to lie. I see people's grows and I just go, ugh, wow. Yeah. People who I thought knew how to grow mushrooms. So I'm a little, I'm a little scared. Uh, you're telling me you're going to teach people how to grow them at home mm -hmm. and they're going to look sexy. Correct. Well, I mean, they're, they look a little alien by themselves already. Sure. As is, but teach them not how to grow specifically on bugs, but on rice, supplemented rice. Um, and uh, it's really not that scary. It's not too difficult. It's just a different type of growing than natural, like gourmet mushrooms or um, uh, soil loving, mycorrhizal loving uh, mushrooms. A um, little bit different. They're parasitic mushroom, so their life cycle is a little quicker. Um, and you just mm -hmm. kind of have to watch time frames, temperature, things like that. Um, but I kind of think they're actually the easier mushroom to grow than everything else because you don't have to have a controlled environment for them. They live in their own controlled environment. So it's, uh, okay. it's quite nice for people that don't have a, a, you know, a big setup or anything like that or just want to get into some different type of uh, mushroom growing um, that's not along the, you know, the similar lines of what everybody else is kind of doing. So. All right. So you're, you're telling me, so are you saying you'd say this is easier to do than just buying one of those Masters Mix blocks? Uh, well, a, a little, little more yeah, steps, yeah. but, no, but yeah. not harder. No, no, no. Honestly, oh. the amount of time, if you were to get like a grow block, do it on your kitchen counter, you're going to have to worry about moisture, temperature, things like that. You can only grow so many varieties, mm -hmm. um, mostly oyster mushrooms. You can get away with lion's mane. Um, but aside from that, you need a controlled environment. These guys, once they're colonized and growing, you leave them alone and you don't do anything except maintain temperature and uh, light spectrum. Um, so it's uh, fairly easy. Um, you, they pretty much sit at room temperature for 30 to 70 days. All right. So um, that that's come. I thought they had to be in a cold environment. I thought, man, I'm going to have to buy a freezer or well, something to cool off a of space. Temperature does affect them quite a bit. Okay. So they don't have to be super cold, but they can't be super hot. So it's generally uh, around 55 to 75. I like to keep it under 70 degrees, though. Hmm. Um, prime temperature for colonization growth is in, in the 60s. So. All right. My basement's usually about 68. Perfect. Absolutely All right. perfect. Okay. That makes me feel good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So so now, did you go to the Ohio Mushroom Festival last year? Because I don't think no. we met at that point yet. No, we think met. We um, I think we met after that, not mm. too long after that. Um, you had gone and taken the, the recap video and things like that. And then we yeah. realized that we were neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not like neighbors, neighbors. <laughs> but, but pretty, we, pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Not too far up the street. Yeah um and then yeah we got, got together and started talking about cool. stuff so you um, went last year no i did not go oh, last you did year not. i was supposed oh, so to go i was supposed to be a part year. of it but 
other things came up, some health issues. So Okay. All right. Well, I can't wait to have you there. Yeah. Uh, I had a blast l last year for yeah, sure. Yeah, I heard good um, things. The foraging was, was pretty solid. We found a lot of mushrooms. Uh, we had people like Crystal Davidson IDing the mushrooms at yeah. the table. Um, this year, I mean, as you and I have discussed, it's a little bit, a little bit drier this year. We'll see what we can get. I, I'm crossing my fingers for some rain, yeah. um, but, but we'll see. All right. So, um, so you're talking about cordyceps. Yep. Now l let's talk a little bit, uh, about just what you do overall. In general for as for the sports store? Well, I, uh, I grow a lot of fresh mushrooms for the West Side Market, um, so local restaurants, uh, mostly Lion's Mane, oyster mushrooms, Piapino, chestnut, um, do some farmer's markets. Um, I'm a one-man operation, so I have to watch how much I take on. Um, looking at growing, bringing on some employees, things like that, um, but appropriately. Um, but I'm trying to get away a little bit from fresh and for, focus more on my extracts. Uh, cordyceps extract, lion's mane extract, which I've made into a gummy, and uh, most importantly, and bigly, uh, not big, most importantly, a, um, a mushroom coffee. Um, pretty proud of that one. It's based on six extracts. Uh, tastes like coffee, smells like coffee. Uh, it's really tasty. Um, not like other mushroom coffees, which I'm, I'm banking on. Um, no grit or residue, uh, water soluble, tastes like coffee smells like it uh, gives you an energy boost without the crash so it's uh um 100 fruiting bodies i'm all about whatever whether it's a mushroom powder i'm selling at the uh farmer's market or going into a product 100 fruiting bodies there's a big you know what's better biomass or fruiting bodies or mycelium um i'm always going to stick with 100 fruiting bodies so all right guys i'm gonna tell you right now I have drank many a cup of Leland's coffee. It's called Spore Spark. Like he said, it dissolves instantly in hot water. It tastes like coffee. Uh, there's no caffeine in it, but it does give you a pretty nice boost. There's cordyceps, lion's mane, uh, and then a bunch of other natural uh, botanical extracts that, that give it the coffee flavor. It's good. If you come to the Ohio Mushroom Festival, definitely check out his booth. Go check out some Spore Spark. There we go. Quick plug on the Spore Spark. I've come over a handful of times and and you always got, yeah, piapinos, oysters, chestnuts, lion's mane. I mean, you're you're growing all the gourmet mushrooms, uh, even reishi yeah. sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes reishi. Um, how did you get into growing mushrooms? Like, where, how, do, how do you go from just being Leland Gordon to Leland Gordon, the, the, the gourmet mushroom farmer? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's kind of weird being called a farmer, but it, it is... Uh... Um, it is what I do. I do actual farming as well, not just um, uh, growing mushrooms. But I grew up uh, hating mushrooms, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I got introduced to button mushrooms, didn't like the taste and like the, you know, the smell, the, the texture, anything like that. Um, I didn't like them, but I liked how they looked, kind of the science behind them, how unique and alien-like they were. Um, so I loved going mushroom hunting with my father and my grandfather, uh, which was mostly for morels in the spring kind of did some oysters, things like that, but nothing too, too in depth. But, um, so every spring I look forward to going morel hunting and then it came, developed into art. And then I did a uh, science project in high school where I made my own grow block um, and then grew it and it grew some shiitakes, harvested them, you know, things like that. Um, the step-by-step -step process of uh, a master's mix blocks pretty much. Um, that was when I was 15. And then I kind of got away from it. Um, was just a chef for quite a few years. Um, but I was still hobby growing on the side, um, you know, just some oyster kits, some little hobby grows. Um, I couldn't ever find the amount of fresh mushrooms as a chef that I wanted to. Quality mushrooms other than the store-bought portobello, cremini, maybe shiitakes, you know, butt mushrooms, oysters here and there. Um, and you would have to get them from a purveyor and they weren't quality, you know, just um, that... I knew there was more out there and I want to be able to make that bridge. So I got into growing mushrooms a little bit more hardcore as I was growing hardcore and became a more, more than a hobbyist, uh, certified by the state, built a facility. Um, with the facility, I started to get more in depth, uh, kind of go down the rabbit hole, the mycology rabbit hole. Um, depends on which one you want to go down, whether it's gourmet, whether it's cordyceps, whether it's medicinals, whether it's uh, philocybenics, you know, there's, there's so many different avenues in the mycology world. Um, so it's kind of hard not to get swept up and do too much. And that's kind of what I've been doing with the last few years is doing too much 
and kind of now this year finally finding my niche and what 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 I'm good at and uh, getting that out to the people. So. Wow. So back when you were a kid, man. Okay, and I. I was never so creative about my science projects. I never figured out how to parlay a science project into like my own interest or something like that. So that's really cool. Um, talk to me a little bit about, and, and I think that's a great lesson for a lot of people. A lot of my viewers get really excited. They go all in. Yeah. They're like, okay, cool. We, we grew this. Now we got to grow that and this and this and this and this. And then some we, recently I had a, a episode where people were talking about getting a little burned out. Yeah. yeah, you got you got to figure out what do I really like doing. Mm -hmm. What what do I think I'm doing something special with? Yeah, yeah and kind of pull back to that. So okay, now speaking of that, let's talk about uh, the Sports Spark uh, product. Let's talk about how you make it. Let's talk about your um, why your product isn't gritty. Okay. Why it dissolves and why it costs a little bit more because of all that, because there's quite a lengthy process involved. So correct, just correct. kind of give people an overview of what goes into making a bag of sports bar. Well, it's uh, an extract process. There's many different types of extract process. It's an alternative to other mushroom coffees. There's no grit or residue. It's 100% water soluble. When that, any of those extracts hit water, it completely dissolves. I know the quality of what they're going in. It's 100% fruiting bodies. I'm growing them. I'm processing them, everything in general the amount of biomass that's in a tremendous amount of other mushroom products, even your mushroom supplements, anything in general, everybody should be kind of worried about what they're getting. In fact, with cordyceps, a lot of it is filler, which is the rice grain that it's grown on. So what we have is cooked supplemented rice that has been sitting for 30 to 70 days. And if it is per, per, right. per, perfectly not contaminated, okay, cool. But even then, you're you're grind, they're grinding that up and putting it in filler, using that even to use as extracts as well. I think the extracts need to be as pure as possible. It's a process. It's it's and it's it's not a fun process to go through. Uh, it's lengthy. Um, water is the the enemy of extract. Uh, any type of moisture, so it's uh, um, it's difficult during you know with temperature regulation and things like that. Things going on inside the grow house, the processing facility. There's a lot to it, guys. I thought I don't want to buy these expensive coffees. This is before I knew about Spore Spark, and so I ordered the chaga and, and I ordered some uh, cordyceps. Some I ordered some off eBay that that were supposedly from the U.S. I ordered some uh, that were clearly from from China. And the U.S. stuff looked maybe slightly better. Um, I went through the whole process to do the alcohol extraction, and halfway through the filtering process, I was like, "I don't want to do this. This is too much work. I'm I'm done." So uh, I happily uh, <laughs> buy Spore Spark now. Um, I just think about what people people get in the habit of drinking coffee in the morning, but they don't want the they don't want the jitters. They don't want all that, or they're trying to you know break the Starbucks addiction, whatever. Um, it's tasty. My, yep. my daughter, my now nine year old daughter religiously <laughs> drinks this stuff uh, at least once a day, whether it's the morning, if she's got time in the morning, she'll have it in the morning, uh, or at night. It's, it's really healthy. You're drinking cordyceps at night, huh? She does. Yeah. Okay. She goes okay. to bed. Okay. Yeah, She goes to bed. She, yeah, she so wears yeah. herself out though. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I take cordyceps every day. Um, if I don't drink the coffee, I'm taking either a powder, but lately I've been, um, taking my mushroom gummies, which I take three times the amount of extract that goes into a cup of coffee and spore spark and I put that into a daily gummy. Mm. Um, and it's just easier way because not everybody drinks coffee. Right. I'm actually one of them. Um, okay. I like the taste and the aroma of it, but I don't drink it all the time. Um, I was never a fan of caffeine and that's part of the reason why I went up uh, and started developing it is there's plenty of caffeine free, you know, um, options out there, but what are they, you know, yeah. what chemicals are they filled with? So. Yeah, well, I really admire one that you're everything you've grown. So everything that goes in it, these mushrooms are mushrooms you've grown. You have, you know, QC around it. These days, you can find a, a, a mushroom coffee that might have five or six mushroom, supposedly mushroom sources in it. But if you do the math, most of them won't ever tell you exactly how much. Correct is in, Correct. they will just say a total amount of weight of, of whatever they're putting in, very few. So I, I, I love that yours is, yours is pure, it's water soluble, 
it just everything about it's great. Um, I really hope, uh, hope all you guys, if you go to Ohio Mushroom Festival, you give it a try. Uh, and if you're not going to the Ohio Mushroom Festival, you can, you can just hop on Instagram, go to uh, the Spore Store, uh, check them out on Instagram. Yeah, at the Mushroom Festival, I'm going to be handing out, um, I will have some fresh, you know, coffee available in the mornings for anybody that wants to have some. Uh, free samples, free sample packets, um, and then I'm going to be giving away some uh, gu mushroom gummies as well. Oh, nice! So I got to try these mushroom gummies. Yeah. Um, all right, so talk talk to me about this. Uh, one thing that I know you took really seriously uh, as a, a gourmet farmer is all the I don't know if it's FDA is it FDA or state licensing and all that state like just like being like on the up and up with everything that you're doing that was quite a process it's quite a process um and you know there's other growers that have gone through the process as well um and it, it's um for to sell in the state of Ohio and to sell to restaurants and grocery stores you need PSR certification um produce safety rule um, that's, it's basically just a class, but, um, an overview of things and then each step of the process, um, you know, you have a licensed facility and then obviously processing, um, that's a whole, whole completely different, um, certification, things like that. Um, coming from the culinary world, if you're going to be in a chef for 10 years, just being working with the health department and everything in general, um, sort of safe certified, it, you, you just kind of, that's the realm that i'm from is you're on the up and up and you have to and if you are it makes it better faster more efficient um just had an inspection like two weeks ago and uh went perfectly fine uh it's just a matter of you know staying on top of that stuff so i need to get a water test done but that's about it um but it's uh um it's not it's not such an in-depth process as much as you, you need to get involved and make sure you're doing things properly um the problem is that many, 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 and it's not mushroom growers, it's just companies of all in nature. The FDA and the Department of Agriculture, who I'm regulated with, um, they can't keep up. There are so many fraudulent mushroom products out there right now um, that they're going after the bad guys. They're not going after the guys that are doing everything by the books. Um, why? Because we're doing everything by the books, you know, trying to, you know, be on our best behavior and work with them. Um, so it's just a matter of um, getting your uh, your ducks in order, making sure things are properly done by procedure, um, and kind of going from there. Um, it's a good idea, though, if anyone wants to get serious with it, um, you know, fines, lawsuits, things in that nature. Um, it, it's good to protect yourself, but it's you know you're you're creating a product for the public. You need to protect the public. It's not just yourself. You're in charge of the public safety, um, and I kind of feel that's quite important. Um, it's very important. We uh, we just did an HPLC episode uh, not too long ago, and that was kind of one of the overarching themes was, uh, you know, man, if you're making something that people are eating or ingesting, absolutely, you kind of got to dot your I's and cross your T's and make sure you're not selling a, a whole lot of bologna to people. As a chef, would you eat that yourself? We, every plate you put out, you know, it needs to be your best. And it's, it's not even that. It's like, well, would you consume that yourself? Would you, you feel good taking money from people selling that? Like, I don't know. It comes down to ethics and just to what type of person you are, I guess. Um, and is it, if it's all about money, you know, are you a company geared for towards just money and making that money? Are you here for what the product you're actually involved with and making? And like, do you have a love for it? Like, well, yeah, I have a love for mushrooms and what I'm doing. Um, and I want to be able to share that with people properly, um, you know, not just take their money and be like, okay, cool. See you later. No, if you want to have a conversation at any point in time, get in touch, talk to me. If you got questions, talk to me, I'll answer them. Um, and I think that's kind of the thing in the mycology world that hasn't been available for a long time. It's always been closed. Um, we all get that. We taught ourselves this, or we taught, I taught myself a tremendous amount, especially with cordyceps years ago, because nobody's out there teaching you how to do it. A lot of fails, a lot of things. So you get entitled to that. This is mine. It's not yours. It's nobody's. You know, it's everybody's. So um, try quit trying to capitalize on it so much and start sharing it. Um, you can make money off it, and you can capitalize in certain manners, but have a certain level of dignity. And at the end of the day, people pay people for their hard work. Right. I mean that even with a book, right? You're, you're paying for the fact that the person took whatever was in their head Absolutely. and turned it into something, something readable. But for sure in, in, in what, in the mushroom space, 
it takes work to grow mushrooms. It takes work to make master's mix blocks. It's Absolutely. all work. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, we talk about this a lot, especially with genetics, isolating a genetic and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you think you have something special, either that's yours and yeah. it stays yours, yeah. or if at any point in time that you decide to make it available to the public, your your baby's growing up. They're right. they're moving out of the house, right. so you better figure out what you want to get <laughs> at that point in time. Because once it's out there, yeah, you got no control over it anymore. It's like a teenage kid in Vegas can do whatever they want to do. Correct, and it's you know it's scary for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Um, and that's I think maybe part of the holdup on some stuff is like people unwilling to share because of what they've worked so hard for, and yeah. they're afraid that somebody else is going to. Um, somebody else is always going to be out there looking to capitalize on you, whatever you're doing in life. Um, one up you, one this, one that. That's just life. That's, uh, you know, um, um, capitalism, you know. Yeah. Um, but at the same point, um, I think having the humble roots and knowing, you know, what you're going after and being respectful about it is the best way or best policy for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody else can do what they want, but for me, that's just how I feel. Yeah, and um, there's also something to be said for, what do you want? Do you, So do you want, if you are if you love your baby yeah. and you don't want it out there and you don't want it to grow up, then don't let it out. Correct. Just sell your products and say, yeah. hey, look, I got this really unique cordyceps strain. It's amazing. Oh. Uh, and you can only get it from me. Yeah. And cool, and leave it yep. at that. Yep. Or if you cross that line and go, nope, I'm going to do, I'm going to go beyond that, then you really can't be surprised well, and even what then, people are going to do with all this stuff. If you're selling strains, what are you selling the strains for? For people to produce that type of mushroom, they're, it's out of the bag. As soon as yeah. you start selling strains, like it, it, you can't even sell strains. Nope. You have to sell finished product. Even then, people who are going to reproduce it um so you know it's 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 about what you want to do in the mycology world and you know what effect you want to have um yeah what you know and it's fine to just want to create a product correct, and keep correct. all Absolutely. your secrets to yourself that's fine yeah. it's that's totally cool i i just notice there are people who let the cat out of the bag mm -hmm. and then get upset when people go do whatever they want with what they just sold them correct can't do yeah, anything. No, I mean, you, you really can't do anything about that. Correct, correct. Well, I mean, sure they made money on it, so. Yeah, exactly. It is what it is, so. Yeah. All right, so let, let me ask you some simple questions. So if, if I'm going to the Ohio Mushroom Festival and I've never grown mushrooms before, but I want to start growing mushrooms, and I really don't have a certain mushroom that I am just have to grow. I just yeah. kind of want to take that first plunge. What do you think the best first step is? If, it, if you've never grown any type of mushroom or have done anything in the mushroom world, I suggest getting a grow block, a basic oyster grow block um, from a reputable company, doing it on your kitchen counter so you can see the process of how it mm. grows and knowing that it needs a certain amount of moisture and fresh air and things like that to see the steps of it sprouting, sporulating, um, open, you know, opening up, sporulating, um, and then maybe even dying, like when, when's too far, things like that. Um, but just to get some basic fresh mushrooms for yourself. After that, maybe make your own master's mix block, um, maybe inoculate yourself, or just get an inoculated block and then do the steps from there. Um, you know, colonize yourself. You know, you can get a, a, you know, a bag that's uncolonized, okay? And then colonize yourself and then go through the steps of making the finishing the block. Um, Starting with gourmet mushrooms is a good idea. I think oyster mushrooms are definitely the most, you know, um, go-to um, for a first-time grower. You can do outside grows, um, but they take a very long time, and they're not always a good teacher of uh, what's going on with the mushroom because you're not in mm. control of the environment. Uh, being in control of the environment is number one with growing mushrooms. Um, but yeah, making master mix blocks, inoculating it yourself, uh, getting a flow hood um, um, rather than a still air box. You know, you can start extremely small, low tech, and you can spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on machinery and equipment and being as fancy as you want to get. You don't have to. I suggest you start low tech, go little by little and learn the steps. If you jump too far ahead, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get frustrated. You will have failures. Um, that's what beats people down. 
um, is failing over and over again and not knowing why. Well, it's because you're trying to do too much before you, you've hit the ground running before you've even learned how to walk. Um, so it's a matter of just, you know, understanding mushrooms. And if you know and understand mushrooms, okay, well, you should be braver to go a different step. Cordyceps, you know, I think they're an easy mushroom to grow, but I think it takes somebody that has grown mushrooms to understand the timing and the process of it that you, you don't do that then or you do this then um, because it, it's, it's more of a delicate uh, procedure with colonization and timing. But once you time it right and it, it's set, you just leave it alone. That's the easier part about it. Gourmet mushroom, you have to control the environment, humidity, FAE, um, temperature, everything in general, how, how they're growing, the CO2 levels. Um, you don't do that with cordyceps. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's kind of a hit or miss, but you know what I mean? Uh, outdoor grows, you could easily get away with. Um, reishi blocks, turkey tail, you know, oyster mushrooms and logs, um, even, you know, straw beds. But um, I still think starting with a, you know, a grow kit, then making your grow kit, and then, you know, going that route is, a, is definitely a good route. I always tell people work backwards. Let's see, let's see if you get really excited when you see the, those mushrooms pop yeah. out of that block. Yeah. Some people go, oh, cool. Okay. And then it, but it doesn't do anything for them. Yeah. Great. Then you very inexpensively figured out that that's not a hobby you want to <laughs> jump into. If, however, like you, me, and a whole lot of people, you see these mushrooms and you think you just witnessed a freaking miracle and you yeah. just can't get enough of it and, and you just want more, more, more. Yeah, we'll start there. And you're right. You do learn the timing. You learn how to baby them a little bit. You learn how to pay attention to environmental factors. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good way of going about it. I know I'm ready to go Ohio Mushroom Festival, foraging, workshops, lectures, checking out all the vendors. Uh, Leland's gonna be there. Gonna have to pick up some more Spore Spark. Gonna have yeah. to try these mushroom gummies. Um, and definitely gonna come do the workshop. Uh, so you'll be doing, that's an ongoing workshop or? Yeah, it'll be, um, so they, they have a set schedule, you know, uh, a lot of different events, things going on. Um, I'll be set up all weekend, uh, just hanging out, vending, but also with the workshop to teach anybody that wants to come through. Um, basics of cordyceps cultivation, not really the science behind cordyceps, but more towards cultivation. Um, have some worksheets and can do step-by-step -step process, the equipment to use, um, get everybody going for some home cultivation. So I like it. Okay. I will be there. That is great. All right, man. Well, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, appreciate this was a lot of fun. Uh, you got a great backyard. I love hanging out in it. Right. So you're yeah. more than welcome anytime. So cool, man, we have to, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to figure out something to go deep on and, and, and we'll, we'll go deep on it. Sounds good to me. All right, man. All well, right. see you in what? Just hardly a week. Yeah. About a week in like two days or yep. something. So. All right, man. Take care. All right. Take care. All right, guys. That was Leland Gordon. Going to be at the Ohio Mushroom Festival teaching everybody how to grow cordyceps. Um, not easy to grow. A lot, lot of little tips, tricks, and secrets. But if you want to grow them at home, which I, you know, why not? Why not? Those, I mean, I've been growing mushrooms nonstop for three years. I have not grown cordyceps yet. So I think I'm going to have to go to that, that workshop. I'm going to have to finally do it. Join me. Let's learn together. Let's figure this out. Let's crack that nut with, uh, with Leland's help. All right. So next up, uh, I cannot on, oh, you know what? I think I just saw an Instagram post and I was like, wait a minute. Peter McCoy, he's got a, he's got a get together coming up. Oh my God. I got to reach out to this guy. See if he wants to come on the show and talk about it. And he, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into, uh, Peter McCoy and, uh, his upcoming event, the 26th through the, I think the 29th rad Michael. All right. Welcome to the show. The one and only legendary Peter McCoy. What's up, man? Not too much MG. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Uh, all right, so first off, I'm going to just go ahead and say right now, uh, the award for the best mise-en-scene, the best set design, I think to date, goes to Peter McCoy, guys. Uh, the set looks fantastic. I love it. Uh, the attention to detail is great. And uh, I got to love a guy with uh, black room glasses. So here we are. We, um, I, I'm usually dealing with people who are on a webcam or on their phone or something like that. So this is a treat for me good audio and good video i'm 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 pretty excited yeah no it's i 
I'm putting together online classes. So having something proper was important. And uh, I have a background in media. Um, I actually was studying that in college before I got decided to pivot towards mycology. So I have a pretty solid background in audio engineering, video work, um, even music production. So yeah. Cool, man. Well, then you and I will we'll get along just fine. All right. So let's do this for, for, for everybody who doesn't know who you are. Uh, let, just give me a, a basic overview and, uh, you know, tell me about your book. Um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit about your book and then we'll get into what we're really here to talk about, which is, uh, red Mike, red mycology, red myco event coming up here. Um, so yeah, just give people a taste of who you are. We'll go from there. Sure. I got into mycology 20, over 20 years ago when I was a teenager, sort of just as one of many eclectic hobbies I had. And the few books that were available, um, even though they were hard to read as a kid, got me hooked, as, as a lot of people can probably relate. And uh, it kind of was a secret hobby. None of my friends shared it for a bunch of years. And then I finally met folks in my early 20s. And it's, a, of course, a long story, but I started teaching um, mostly cultivation initially. But at the same time, I had all these ideas that had been brewing in my brain about how mycology had all these other benefits and maybe relates to topics like environmental health and, and sort of everybody should know about this, but nobody was talking about it. And um, ideas I'd been sort of thinking about for years to myself um, evolved in conversation with friends. And then I started doing more events. And in then 2016, super long story short, I put a lot of these ideas and all, basically everything I knew into my first book called Radical Mycology, a treatise on seeing and working with fungi. And that was kind of the book I had always wanted growing up. It was all the cool stuff, a lot of skills, but a lot of the deeper insights, um, my personal sentiments, things that really motivate and move me about mycology beyond just the practical, uh, woven between all the references and the how-tos. And uh, yeah, that came out, um, was well received. And I knew way more than I was able to put into the book. So I started uh, making moves towards putting together an online school, well, in, in person and online, Michael Logos. And I rolled that out sort of phase one, I say, in 2019. Um, and then uh, had to sort of pivot life plans because of how the way the world went. And the silver lining to all that was I have been evolving Michael Logos since in a whole new direction, sort of phase two, I say, it hasn't launched just yet, but that's a big, actually huge part of my life that is a little bit um, still sort of behind the scenes right now. And then along the way, uh, the radical mycology concept or notion or name or, or whatnot is not just a book, but it's also sort of a I don't know, a way of approaching mycology. When we first started doing it, me and my friends, we, we the first big event we held was in 2011. We were trying to think outside the box of how mycology was approached then before it was, you know, cool, before there was all these documentaries. So we were kind of, we felt cool <laughs> and radical for doing that. Um, and then since then, the, the event has grown. We now do it every other year. Um, our seventh one is coming up at the end of this month here in Oregon. And that's also something just more of a labor of love. And that's a big, big event we'll talk about, um, trying to expand conversations that sort of initially were, I don't know, I tried to put into my, my first book, sort of showing all these different ways we can approach mycology beyond just the initial sort of entry level uh, topics. And yeah, and then along the way, um, during COVID, I started the Fungi Film Fest with a couple of friends, and now I do that every other year, every year. Um, and we just closed the submission window. So now it's about curating that. And then it premieres in uh, usually late November, early December here in Portland. And then it's online for a month for streaming around the world. And we can talk about that. Uh, that's been super fun. That was like, a, yeah, started during COVID and was so successful. I just kept doing it. And yeah, I also wrote a second book that came out a couple of years ago uh, called The Microcultural Revolution. It's, it's kind of ostensibly, it's like a super slimmed down version of my first book. First book's big, new book small, um, but I made them different. Uh, the new one is just kind of for anybody stocking stuff or type of thing. Give it to grandma, give it to, you know, your 15 year old nephew or whoever. Very intro, to, and, but still gives you a lot of mostly skill focused with uh, a bit of sentiment woven in, but not nearly as 
technical or heady as, as my first book. Um, yeah. And I got a bunch of other stuff going on at, uh, behind the scenes. So that's what I'm up to. That's it. Come on, <laughs> man. We sleeping in too much. You got, you got to get up, you got to get up earlier. God dang. Yes. I love that. So yeah, the, the first book is big, but man, I almost feel like, I mean, shit, you, you said it, it's not even a book. It's a freaking treatise. It's like, it's the whole, it's everything. All, all you're trying to do is change how I see fungi. That's it. Just how I see them. That's everything. Right. So, I mean, I love that that book was huge and it had everything in it. Did you, when you were putting the book together, did, um, did, did the publisher ever go, Peter, <laughs> Book's too big. We we got to, you know, we need a smaller book. Nobody's going to read 700 pages about mushrooms. Or did they just say, we love you, whatever you want, you got it? Well, that I am the publisher. I'm self-publisher. So oh. I made those decisions. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, so initially, so the book was funded through through Indiegogo, uh, the lesser known Kickstarter uh, in 2014. And the initial idea, so I had where it all started really a piece of the story I didn't just say is when I was 20, 21, or uh, yeah, somewhere around there, I read a little zine, a little booklet called Radical Mycology. And that was, um, I think like 44 pages, little thing. It was mostly for me and my friends. And it was a little bit more tongue in cheek. Um, there were some sort of like manifesto -y essay bits that people say they still like. Uh, for me, it was just trying to like, I don't know, have fun sharing the stuff I knew most of my friends, but then that got out, people like it. And a couple of years later, I'd sold thousands around the world. I was like, Oh, people actually care about this. This is again, way before it was like 2008. Um, so the uh, so when I a few years later did this Kickstarter or Indiegogo rather, and my thought was to take a little zine and maybe make it, you know, three times as big or something. I, you know, I was like, Oh, I know more. Well, as with anything, at least for me, when I start working on it, I, oh, there's not only more, you know, unknown unknowns or whatnot that I go into, but you just kind of start to do it, immerse and realize how it can be better. And so initially I thought six months turned into a two year project, pretty much all I was doing for two years. And, you know, as, as it ended up, I was trying to really survey the landscape and for each, the way the book is broken down for folks who haven't seen it, it's 12 chapters with a bunch of appendices and some other stuff in the back. Um, you know, and it's like biology, ecology, these are chapter themes, biology, ecology, human relationships, you know, food, medicine, indoor cultivation, outdoor cultivation, psychedelics, um, a couple other things. And within that, there's like sub essays and each of those little sub essays, I mean, it's just like each one, you know, I'd, I would stew on forever and just like trying to condense so much information, pack as many citations some of the stuff I say sounds outlandish and I wanted to back up what I'm saying. So there's over 700 right. footnotes. Most of them are citations, peer reviewed papers to back up all this crazy stuff I'm talking about. Um, yeah. And every step of the way it was, I mean, everything was a choice. Every single thing in there is a choice. And I didn't hardly say as much as I wanted to, um, which is why I wanted to make on, you know, making online classes to expand so much. So that's why I self published it. I didn't know it was gonna be so big initially, but I knew I want I was gonna say stuff that at the time, you know, had never been said about mycology. So any publisher would be like, Oh, this isn't the normal mushroom book, we got to stay within the, the lanes and, and I wanted to break out. Um, so not only did I have the freedom, give myself the freedom to say whatever I want, say kind of out there stuff, whatever, if you read it, you know, what I'm talking about, uh, but also make it as big as I wanted to. And it was a big gamble, you know, and, um, you know, even the, just the price and the size. And these are all like really un, unconventional things. Um, it's definitely risky. Um, but I'm glad I took the risk. I'm glad you took the risk. I think a lot of people are. I, I mean, if you're going to buy a book, I recommend this one to many, many people all the time. Like, oh, you're, you're really getting into it. You seem really excited. What book should you buy? Yeah, Peter McCoy's book. No? Okay, well go buy his book. Cause I mean, there are lots of amazing books that are very old and they might have particular little bits of information in them, but man, for somebody in the context of the here and now modern world, I mean, you, you really wrote the book that hadn't been written yet. So I, I'm glad you're the publisher. I, I mean, dude, I thought I was going to get some juicy stories about how you had to arm wrestle some editor to, to get this and get that, but no, okay. That makes sense. 
why go to a, these days? Why? Why go to a publisher? I mean, you can go there. You can take one trip to China and get whatever you want or make the right phone call and say, here's what I need. And you just get it done. So uh, good, good on you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> got a question about. Let's go to the the heart. Let's go to the the more radical idea. So, okay, Re talk to me, teach me. I haven't pretend I haven't read the book. What do you mean by radical mycology? Yep, I get that one. Um, well, so it, it, you know, I've gotten that basically since I wrote the zine, you know, a long time ago, and uh, the the definition or the off the optional answers are many to it. Um, and the, to some degree, I distilled it in the introduction to my book. I even in like the preface gave a couple like written out definitions of what am I talking about? And it's several, so it's several different things. Um, I guess initially when we were doing it, the idea was, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about etymology. What does radical mean? It means getting to the root, getting to the undercurrent. Then there's also, the second definition and also more common cultural connotation with the word, which is being at the fringe or, you know, counter, counter the norm, um, you know, counter status quo or, or different than, than tradition, not necessarily against tradition, but just alternative, et cetera, et cetera. And that's essentially where we were coming from. I mean, I was pretty young and I was like, yeah, let's like take mycology and just make it as wild and push whatever boundaries. And at the time, I didn't really know what that meant. I think the biggest thing we focused on initially, me and a couple of friends that I was most excited about the time and still am, but in a different way, was microremediation and the, the potential not only for it to for fungi to help clean up the environment and, and make a change there, but where I guess it kind of gets radical if you want to get political um, is, is just the notion that you can do that. You can do these practices without needing bureaucracy. You don't need to get a stamp of approval. You can, we can do it ourselves. It's very grassroots. And that's, if nothing else, that's my approach to life. I'm a very much a believe in, you know, the people and coming from the bottom up approach versus top down and, and all this kind of things. Um, I'm very interested in uh, independent publishing is something I've been interested in independent arts of all types has been my passion my entire life. Um, so it, this kind of falls in line with that. Let's do independent mycology. Uh, because at the time, and I, I didn't really wasn't even really aware of this. And even still today, it's different, but a lot of mycology, um, especially back then, was just purely academic. And it was kind of institutional and you kind of had very few opportunities to even engage with it in any capacity or commercial growing, which at the time was very secretive. This is like, you know, pre big YouTube blow, blow up and stuff. So it was a it was a very elite sort of vibe type of thing. I kind of came to realize early on and I was like, oh, that's silly. This is so beneficial. We need to like give this to everybody. Like this is clearly a beneficial topic and science. So that was the initial sort of, I guess, vibe as far as radical. Now I've, you know, 20, almost 20 years later, I've evolved that notion in many directions. Um, at the very least, it's just trying to always think about this science and its cultural implications in new ways, kind of pushing our mm -hmm. preconceived notions. One of the things I've come to realize, and I will always make a point or try to always make a point whenever I can, is pointing out for anybody and everybody that we are at a, the beginning of a whole new era of humans interacting with fungi, the human fungal relationship. We, it's an unprecedented time. And in a way that is an incredibly rare opportunity in, in the evolution of human humanity and the human story, we are developing a relationship with a vast chunk of life and a huge piece of the ecosystem that we knew nothing about, had no relationship by and large, especially in the West for pretty much all of modern history, hundreds, thousands of years. Not only are we kind of reconnecting and appreciating this thing we've totally glossed over, we are learning every day new things about all that they do and appreciating that and re reconsidering our paradigm and assessments of the environment, and kind of everything that comes with ecology. And then, of course, uh, cultivation wise, all the applications, which is, of course, a pretty hot topic. And that's all fun, but it's also a huge deal sort of historically, like in 100 years, 200 years, you know, people will look back and say, like, this is the beginning of a when things changed and everybody involved is taking part of that, whether it's just being excited and telling your friends and shifting the norm and getting your grandparents and uncle and aunt who thinks mushrooms are weird to get on the train to, of course, you know, teaching the youth to innovating in your garage or whatever. Like that's, 
everything that's happening right now is a huge deal. And I, I think I try to think from a sociology, almost anthropology standpoint about what we're doing, and the cultural, broader cultural implications of it all. And so because of that, we're entering like a wild west, unknown terrain, all the stuff we're doing, right, it's all unprecedented. So let's constantly say what else is possible, you know, whether it's not only techniques and technical skills and all that kind of stuff. But I come from a, you know, I always think of myself as an artist before anything else. And I'm always trying to get creative with it. Um, I don't think that mycology, the best, the best thing for me, at least, uh, that I've come to to decide to advance mycology and ensure that it's goes on a good track and in a good way is developing sort of a, a cultural set of um, not necessarily like values, but like guidelines, cultural artifacts, and a sense of art and, and a true culture. I like to use the word microculture for lack of a better one. And, you know, find and provide different containers and contexts and ways for people to relate to mycology that moves and motivates beyond just the left brain rational. That can only get us so far. That's a lot of often what you get. And that appeals to certain people, but really what motivates people to care and, and stick with something and really like care, care, care is they got to be moved within. And so I think that uh, is best done through different types of all the different types of art. Um, and that's a broad word. So for like radical mycology for my event coming up, like that's a lot of what we try to do is try to like encourage and create new containers for anybody that wants to contribute to help expand the dialogue in whatever direction we want it to go. And ideally, for me, what gets most exciting is when it's not just new to mycology, but maybe just like new in notions of human existence or something, you know, like not necessarily mirroring, oh, they do this in permaculture world or in, you know, plant medicine world or in these other things. Let's like adopt what's already been done there to mycology. Well, we can, and that's happening in a million different ways. But mycology just fungi show so much, like, let's just go, to, let's do something totally new. And I don't know what that means sometimes. And so we're always trying to do new stuff. Um, and I guess the last definition, and that's a long answer, but it's a big, big question, is uh, I think just generally, and it gets into the subtitle of my book about seeing fungi, to a certain degree, it's, it's almost like a, a philosophical mindset, which is a heavy way to say that uh, I think a lot of people that get into mycology, um, the more you learn about it, you know, there's to a certain degree, you just feel like, wow, 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 this is crazy, this is amazing, kind of uh, fascinating, maybe you get a little bit humbled by these you know, powerful ancient organisms, maybe you're just in awe of all these, all their abilities. And then to a certain degree, and this isn't necessarily for everybody, or people go to different lengths, you can kind of try to think about life as a fungus, like, how would, uh, how would my psyllium approach this topic? Or, or like, I'm an individual human in my culture, which is like the individual Haifa in the broader, it's broader culture. And like, what are some metaphors and parallels and thought experiments I can do? And how can I learn from fungi, just like people's throughout time have learned from plants, learned from animals, learned from the happiness of their house pets, learned from the, you know, endurance of a mountain. Um, nature teaches us things. And fungi has unique things to teach us. And, you know, when I first started saying that 15 years ago, I'm sure it didn't hit <laughs> many people the right way, or didn't make sense. Um, but hopefully more and more people get more or less what I'm getting at. And that I think the, the answer to what that means, or what that really means for the individual is an individual uh, experience that maybe can't be easily put into words. And so it's a little bit embarrassing, you kind of fumble around with the words trying to be like, I care about mushrooms, because it's cool. And it's like, but you actually you're like, but it's so much more, but I can't put it into words. And that's the, that's what I love about it, you know, and that's a lot of what I try to put through sprinkle throughout my book is like, it's so hard for me to convey all these things I've been motivated and, and, you know, feelings I've had about mycology and fungi and, and all this stuff uh, over the years, put it in a way that I can try to express that to you without being heavy handed um, or too sappy. And it, yeah, and it's a take it or leave it kind of thing. At the very least, um, it's, it's a science and a, a set of skills, a, a whole Swiss, a massive Swiss army knife that more people should know exists in the hardware store. Ideally, more people can learn about and how to use or know that it's an optional tool for life and has so many applications. And I think, you know, 10 years, 10 plus years ago, that alone was a radical notion. Okay, so I love all those uh, explanations of, of radical mycology. Be, before I, 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 I want to comment on something you said, but before that, 
there's also just the 80s interpretation of it right like radical man like if you're gonna do mycology like make it radical yes like just amazing cool i used to do freestyle man i like if somebody did something like a cool trick i'd be like radical that was so cool like yes radical mycology if you're totally. gonna do mycology do it like that yeah now, totally yeah i mean yeah making it tubular and just like super duper yes. super rad for sure yes. and that's kind of where it come out i mean yeah uh, i think um you know yeah that, that, that I, I resonate with that that as, yeah. uh, quite a lot. as a writer fun. words are important yes okay see i i knew you had to be a poet you 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 got it you you understand the power of metaphor because it's uh, a little taste of it here and there everywhere throughout the book now something you just said that really has me just sitting there going man yes right like you talk about this relationship and even if, if you go to red mycology site it talks about this is a, a convening for the human relationship with fungus. And, and I thought that was so cool. But what you just said now had me going, wait a minute. Yeah, mankind has had a relationship with plants for a while, particularly grasses, right? Where we loved grasses. We did all sorts of stuff with grasses. And, and now we got corn and we got this and we got that. And we eat a whole bunch of grass products. You are right. We are in a brand new evolution. Like a thousand years from now, this moment will be studied as an agricultural pivot where we all just said, wait a minute, they all don't just kill us. I mean, vast majority of kids uh, from my generation or, or older, it was don't touch that. It's poisonous. Don't touch that. The assumption is every mushroom is poisonous. My little kid, uh, five-year-old uh, is in kindergarten now. He found a mushroom, and of course, because I'm his dad, he's bringing the mushroom up to to show some aid at uh, at recess. And they're like, "Oh, put that down. That could be poisonous." And I already told him. And he he said to the teacher, "Most mushrooms are not poisonous." And the teacher had to talk to me about it. And I said, "No, that's true. You should go look that up. Most mushrooms are not poisonous, and none are poisonous to touch them. So relax, society." So you are right. This is this whole paradigm shift that's happening getting me real excited man i mean this is this is absolutely true and so now let's do this talk to me about okay so so you wrote a book and that was based on a million amazing conversations you'd had with people in the community things you learned and there's a point where you wanted to share it all i can relate to that. that's why i started this podcast but now you got a book it's doing really well and now you want to have an event Talk to me about how the the event has changed over the years, um, the direction you're trying to take it. And then most importantly for this year is it's coming up uh, less than a month from now. Talk to me about what really it's all about. If I go, if I cruise over there and I go to this event, what is the culture? Who am I going to learn about? Really, I want to hear all about the evolution of this event. That's yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. So so the the event was before the book came out. So we did book book came out in 2016. First time we did it was 2011. And it was in, that was inspired because my zine little zine had done so well. Uh, me and some friends were like, well, let's do an event, maybe it'll be like 50 people. And we start putting word out to the internet, you know, just barely had, you know, a little bit on Facebook, basically at the time saying, Hey, we want to do this event that'll focus on like low tech mushroom cultivation and micro-remediation, grassroots micro-remediation. Those were kind of like the banner topics. And, you know, we were young, young and excitable people. And we thought 50 people would come. We probably got more like 250, 300. It was up on this farm in Northern Washington. Super grassroots. None of us had done anything like that. It was luckily the farm had a lot of some infrastructure we had and we made it work and it was great. We didn't have a schedule. Um, we just, it was like, it was like the field of dreams. If you build it, they'll come. They came. We just kind of like organically assembled a schedule. There was workshops the whole time, and and we did some we did some installations, um, sort of micro remediation inspired type of installations on the property. Um, you know, we had a talent show. I think, uh, you know, a couple other activities. It was just like an organic event, very very rustic. So that was the first one, and it was great, super fun, and and really for me personally, that was the moment where I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Uh, prior to that, I'd been I've been interested in mycology for a bunch of years. And I was in college at the time and I was considering 
uh, media. I was considering documentary filmmaking. I was considering becoming a Chinese doctor, um, Chinese medicine doctor. And, and then I started looking around and I was like, you know what, mycology is clearly important. All my friends are like herbalists and there's a million filmmakers. Nobody's teaching mycology in any capacity. Like maybe this is what I should do because I care about this just as much as the other topics. And then I did this event and it was like, people came up to me, you know, just one little anecdote. Like there was people that came up to me saying that it dramatically changed their life. And I mean, looking back, it was a very humble event, but people said huge things to me. Elders said huge things to me about how, how thankful they were that, that my college was going to not go in a bad direction because of what we were doing. And then young people who were lost said that this was giving them a new direction. So I was just like, wow, this is important work. I should do this. Um, yeah, so we did it the following year, 2012, at a different farm. And the the idea essentially initially was because mycology was still so inaccessible, and we knew we were doing something of value. We wanted to try to like move it around. And every time we would do the event, it would be in a different location, bring it, bring it to a different community, teach these skills, bring people together, even from the first one, the emphasis wasn't so much, it was equal, I mean, 50-50 about skills and knowledge, but just as much about community building, because definitely the time mycology wasn't cool. It wasn't rad uh, culturally. And the people that came is like, you're not a weirdo for liking this thing. We're all on the same level. And like, it's fine. Like we can be all be excited about this. And not just because we can eat them, but because of what they're doing in the environment, all these other eclectic angles of mycology and people, people, get, and I had no idea, like people came up to me like, I've been interested in mushrooms. I've been going to clubs for 20 years. I've never been to an event like this. This is like what I've been looking for for the last 20 years. And I was like, I didn't even know this was needed. You know, so, so again, really quickly, we're like, all right, we, we, we are offering something. So we did the next one in Washington again. And then we did it in uh, Illinois. Two years later, we decided to do every other year because it's quite a lot of work. And then New York, uh, Illinois, then New York, um, and then to Oregon, just outside of Portland 2018. And that's, after doing those several other locations, which was great, you know, Midwest and then East Coast, definitely built different communities and different lines of topics. But I'll, so much of our bandwidth would just go to like the nuts and bolts of the event, just make it happen, like basic, all the basics. And that was, and it was all volunteer at the time, and it was all labor love, and none of us were getting paid. And that was all fun. But for the amount of work and like the amount of effort we put into it, it just became, it just felt eventually unsustainable. Like it was not a working model. The, there's great value. It is beautiful to be like, oh, we're moving around, we're bringing it to people. Um, but by 2018, it was like, well, the word's getting out. And this is no longer a great need to, to move it around. Let's anchor it at this amazing location we found Brown Bottle Farm. And let's build something really great. So 2018 was mostly getting the nuts and bolts figured out there, which worked out great. Our hosts are wonderful that, that uh, run the farm. Uh, we were going to do 2020 there again, but we had to cancel. So then in 2022, we uh, put it together. Um, and by that time, I evolved the event. I said, you know, this is, this is a, my, the world of mycology is expanding so much. Let's make something that is really special. Um, I'm familiar and I've been to a number of the other big mycology events. I've been to, you know, quite a range of them over the years. And let's, let's do something, you know, uh, in the radical mycology ethos. And it's kind of what I was saying earlier, where it's heavily leans into the arts plus the sciences plus making space for new voices and new conversations. And that's, and at the same time, trying to bring people together, and especially in a way where you're primarily sober, we don't really emphasize psilocybin, not that it's like something we're against. It's just like, we don't emphasize culinary, we don't emphasize identification, and we don't emphasize psychedelics, because those are everywhere. Every other mushroom events, like you can get plenty of that. There's, and if you read my book, hopefully you get a sense there's a lot, there's all these other cool things about mycology to talk about. So, so it's kind of intentional that we try to like really introduce you to, to new ways of thinking, lots of skills. If you look at the schedule, there's this year, we have over 40 workshops, it's slam packed, tons of skills, but also some really interesting cultural talks, variety of topics I can, I can list out. Um, and then we do tons of cultural events. So every night there's different cultural activities. There's a variety of different games and competitions that just sort of build community, have, we try to have a lot of fun. You know, it's one thing, in the science world I've experienced where it just gets so sciencey, you kind of forget that we're humans and we like to laugh and just be silly, you know, and I'm a get at heart kind of thing and get creative um, at the same time. And then with my art background, uh, art is a huge thing. So, 
So yeah, the event has evolved, essentially, kind of long story short. So now where it is, so in 2022, we we evolved it in these directions. We had the nuts and bolts figured out, as I say. We were able to add some layers of, of beautification, decor, dressing, and uh, more intentional moments, and then really thinking through all the small moments and ways for people to connect. And now 2024, it's like even better, you know, 100 times better. Um, I'd say the... What I'd like to think that makes the event special, and not just in the world of mycology, but in, event, in events generally that I've been to, and, and attendees, many attendees said this to me in 2022, and I was like, oh God, I feel seen, <laughs> which is that it's like a combination of a technical science mycology conference, because there's a lot of, you know, some of that science and skills, but also like a, I don't know, like a, a, a music festival, uh, because there is, this year we don't have a ton of a ton of music. You can see the performers on the, the website. Last time we had some more music, but we switched it up. Um, but again, but more because it kind of feels like a party vibe. But then there's it's super family friendly because we're not emphasizing drugs. There is like alcohol served at night, but you know keep it family friendly. And um, yeah, and it's just like rooted and and real. And we try not to get too caught up in. Um, I don't know, uh, short term, short, you know, like sort of ephemeral topics or sort of topical issues. And for me, I'm really interested in, in sort of, I think, long term about what the work that we're doing and how do we sort of build again something that's really sustained and meaningful that endures. I don't have all the answers, but I'm trying to create sort of interesting ways to play with this bigger topic that's a little bit harder, super hard to address for anybody. So let's like all talk about it and get excited about, again, this beginning of this start of this era that we're kind of entering and all playing a part of. So yeah, there's like kind of a lot to it. Um, but and the way that we execute that the best we can every time we improve is so one with the the workshops and the lineup, again, we have over 40, 40 talks this time, and it's a range of topics. So there's, you know, cordyceps cultivation intro, there's, there's uh, fungal genomics breeding, you know, we have that stuff. Uh, we do have some micro remediation focus talks, we have um, Mycomaterials on and off planet is one of the talks. You can imagine what that is. We have um, uh, Christopher Hobbs, who wrote Christopher Hobbs Medicinal Mushrooms, you know, expert medicinal mushrooms. He's given a few talks. So we have that and much more. We have foods and ferments. We do have some foods and preservation. Um, you know, some of your more sort of standard topics, if you will. But then where I think it gets a little bit more outside the norm is, uh, for example, like my talk. One of my talks, so I'm doing microscopy, you know, using microscopes. But then uh, one of uh, one of my personal passion projects in mycology and research and ethnomycology is the relationship of Amanita muscaria, Vlad Garrick, to the Celtic goddess Brigid, and she's super important uh, in the pantheon, sort of toe to toe. She became a, a saint when the church entered Ireland, and she's on par with Saint Patrick, and there's a ton about her I could tell you about, but she's, in my opinion, historically, the goddess version was very connected to Fly Garrick, and nobody had ever looked into that. And so I've, I've written a bunch about that. So I'll give a talk on that. And that's super fascinating to me, cultural uh, insight. And, and for example, that happens down at our what we call the grail stage is this beautiful natural amphitheater on the property that we dress and set uh, to be inspired, like kind of like an a Amanita muscaria cap that's upturned the way that the property of the land sort of forms it's like that but um yeah we rebuilt whole new stages this year it's just like another whole topic to, to beautify everything and lighting is so much better this year to make it just a really really beautiful space and experience another and then just like a whole other angle to to the way we're approaching things this year that i think is the kind of eclectic but i'm excited about is uh in my book in the first chapter uh it's ostensibly the most like technical and sort of overwhelming chapter in retrospect, because I get really into the nitty gritty about how my psyllium works and all this kind of stuff, but it lays the foundation in my thinking. Well, one of the things to talk about is that we don't know, really know how my psyllium extends, how it actually functions. It's like a huge mystery, like most fundamental notion of how hyphae work. We don't really can't fully answer. Yeah. Well, I, pr I propose in there um, that it might in part be resolved. This question might in part be resolved by what is called the fourth phase of water. And this is a, a state that water is believed and more or less known to enter between solid and liquid. It's like a liquid crystal. And this research was pioneered by a professor at a University of Washington, Gerald Pollack, legit guy. Even if you've never heard of this, you can look him up, super legit science. 
he's like our keynote speaker. He's going to be talking about his fourth phase of water work. Now it's not a mushroom talk, but it absolutely relates to hyphal extension, water in the environment, earth, you know, the universe. And, and I'm very excited to talk to him. I'm also trying to get him on a panel where he can talk about, we'll talk about fungal ecology more broadly. And so more audience Q&A and we can just pontificate and, you know, we can, we can ask all the, my approach to mycology is let, never say no, because we often don't know. And let's always say, well, what if, I mean, let's just say the craziest stuff, but always be the caveat. Well, we don't, we don't know. You know, that's part of the problems with saying crazy stuff is when you act like, you know, when it's, <laughs> you don't know, and it's crazy, right. but it's fun with mycology to be like, well, what if this super wild notion is possible? And what's fun. And one of the reasons I love mycology is you can say that stuff and nobody, even some of the scientists, mycologists, academics can tell you you're wrong because they don't know for certain that you're wrong. And so it's not good science to be like, well, that's not possible. You got to leave the range, range of possibilities open until they're fully discredited. And with mycology being so young, and we know so little, there's tons of unanswered questions. So it's fun to play. So, you know, again, so with the fourth phase of water, we got Gerald Pollack coming down. That's like amazing. And then as a part of that as well, uh, we put a lot of intention into theming the event. So it's a part of the surprise, but also something that I kind of wish I knew how to convey better through the website and whatnot, is we're actually putting a lot of thought into not just the stage design and lighting and that kind of experience, but also creatively in quite a number of ways, tying in fire and water throughout the event. Um, so in 2022, we, we had the theme of honoring succession, and we tried to roll this notion in that Fungi teach us, you know, let's, what's the, one of the many lessons fungi can teach us? This year's focus on succession. In ecology, this is the notion that, you know, one plant replaces another one as an, a, a habitat either evolves or recovers from devastation. And fungi are pivotal to changes in the environment. And we chose armillaria or honey mushrooms as the like featured, you know, symbol of that concept. And we had a lot, a lot of armillaria going on. And it was just, we tried to, you know, have a theme. Well, anyway, this year, we said, what's the first step after succession or, you know, in, in succession or in one state, form of succession. And we thought about fire, fire is a big topic these days environmentally. And the first sign of life after fires are little yellow fungi called anthracobia. It's a genus. And so we, they're great. There's a little write up on the website. I wrote about how, um, you know, they, they embody these notions of fungi of, of under little tiny underdogs, but with such great strength. And they remind us to be resilient and, you know, we can uh, wax poetic all about them for good reason. And so not only are we trying to tie anthracobia in to the scheduling to some degree, and even the, the art show we have, there's actually quite a lot of art pieces that are themed around anthracobia that artists have submitted in the art show, but also sort of in the way the spaces are set up. Uh, that's part of the surprise when people arrive, but it's like, we really put a lot of thought into immersing you in this experience. Um, yeah, so again, without giving too much away, it's like there's a lot of fire vibe going on, not actual fire, but creative stuff we've done to bring the sense of fire. Um, and then as we were evolving the event, we're like, oh, well, clearly water comes along with that. And not just because it's the opposite, but because of what fungi do to bring water uh, through their mycelium to a dry environment and how we can play with that sort of through different activities and uh, some of the installations we'll do just to get people thinking. Now, some people, I don't know, you know, I, I have no idea how people perceive this from the outside. As a team, we're like super excited. I'm sure some people are going to come be like, oh, this is way too woo or we're out there. I just want the science. And that's all, all there for you, I hope as well. But hopefully we, we encourage, you know, a little bit of open mind, try something new. Think about, you know, is it, is art reflecting life, life reflecting art type of thing? Like how, how on a limb are we going? And hey, isn't that also just interesting? Didn't you have a good time doing this kind of weird thing <laughs> that you don't know how to describe to your friend that didn't come to the event? Like that's a lot of what we're about. Um, and then at the, at the end of the day, you can walk away and be like, well, I learned this skill, I learned this skill. And you know, the music and you know, the music was fun. And uh, the art show was banging. We have over 40 artists from around the world. We have a VR installation where you live as a hypha high full tip, uh, it's like a 10 minute experience. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. There's video uh, projection installations. There's a million things going on. Um, <laughs> so it's a super long answer, but there's just so much to say. And I could probably say a whole lot more. <laughs> Man, after I get off uh, off recording this podcast, I got to go talk to my wife about how can I get up to Portland. <laughs> Luckily, I have an excuse to go up there. So we'll see. You got me excited, man. Wait, so I get to listen to you have uh, uh, tell me about an ancient 
Irish goddess, Greek goddess, who, who, who? Uh, yeah, Irish Celt. I don't know if I said that. Uh, Irish, Irish goddess, Celt. who, yeah. who, who is whose story is interwoven with Amanita Muscaria. While I'm sitting inside a giant Pileus, yes, that's yeah, what exactly. I'm all about. Exactly, that's yeah. what I'm all about. So what you're doing, <laughs> right? You're, and most importantly, for somebody who sees the power of a brand new metaphor, right? Uh, it's fungi is a brand new form of life. It's it's a it works differently. It's a different metaphor. I say it's like the postmodern kingdom, right? Like the way it's just it's new. It's it it's about connections. The organism itself is just a bunch of connections. That is the mycelium, which is very postmodern. Absolutely. No, but, absolutely. But you are literally bringing so many cool things together. But what I really love is that you're holding space for the other, not the mainstream, not the like. Well, we like this and we like this. And I heard Paul Stamet say that I can do this. And maybe there's a fungus that'll kill my carpenter ants and, and all that stuff. Yes. Great. Cool. Yep. That's the lens of like functionality. Like how can we functionally utilize mushrooms, but you miss out on all the magic or even, even the way that psilocybin is being toted as it's going to cure this. It's going to cure that. Oh, you're just, you're, you're reducing it now into just the medicine. What if the mushrooms and the fungi are so much bigger than any of those lenses. And that's what it sounds like your festival, your gathering is trying to do is give space for all the, the more inspiring, amazing things that, that can come from thinking outside the box. I like that. Yeah. I mean, my, my greatest mentors in life died hundreds of years ago and they were, uh, Renaissance, Renaissance men, you know, using the entire brain, thinking about everything and skilled in many directions. And those are the people that, for me, that are most inspiring that, and look at their, their bodies of work, they pushed boundaries, and they thought outside the box. And, and they were probably called crazy at their time or whatever, or, or not understood. And I don't want to say that I'm like on on that par or something like that. But just like, I take inspiration from that. And I think that yeah. some of the great people of history have moved, moved, moved culture by by saying stuff that had never been said. Um, I try to say things that I, I find interesting and hopefully some of them have never been said, right. That everybody wants to contribute new ideas, but as a curator and also as an artist and also just because at the end of the day, like my ecology is so big, um, and it's, it's so small at the same time, like the world, like who am I to, to dictate it or like act like I have the, the, the space, like. Uh, before I wrote a book, you know, I was just some random kid from the burbs, you know, and I just started to do this. I didn't grow up in mushrooms. I didn't have any relationship. I didn't have any mentors. I had to totally teach myself. I was been, I've been entirely self-guided the entire way. Um, and, you know, and if I had to self-encourage by and large to, to, to do some of the hard work and I want to encourage other people and make space and to, and to tell them that even though you might not have some perfect, amazing background in mycology and all the check boxes checked, you have something valuable to say. You have your life experience, your perspective on this thing that everybody coming to this event and coming to this science or this topic has a unique perspective on. And that we're all going to bring our own twist, you know? And a lot of those twists might be kind of similar to other twists, whatever. You know, at the end of the day, uh, what I think something I've always said really early on is if a given person doesn't have the time or bandwidth or whatever to really like do quote unquote mycology in any like practical way, um, at the very least, telling their friends and neighbors and family that that it's not a bad thing, telling their kids teacher, like not all mushrooms are poisonous, you know, like just shifting the paradigm, like that's, that's where we're sadly at as a culture, we need to get rid of these outdated taboos, and just start to normalize this thing. This is what we were trying to do in 2011 with the first event, just normalize like, you know, and then I wrote the book so we could all be like talking about the same know we're talking about together. We've yet to even break through really to anything like sort of broadly speaking, um, of course, there's there's many pockets within the subculture that are super advanced, etc. But you know, broadly, culturally, right, we're still at like, oh, the wow factor. And oh, wow, they can do the mycelium. Whoa, which is great. Don't get me wrong. But that is absolutely, in my opinion, the starting point, and it's gonna take a long time before, but hopefully, maybe quicker than I can imagine. But um, there, there's so much further to go, which is the exciting part, right? Everything about my college is super exciting, because it's all new, and it's all evolving. I, I could I could teach you a ton about micromediation. I can teach you about lots of the sciencey stuff, and that's what I will be doing through my classes. And I can get into all that. Um, 
it's like, I, for me, I personally try to juggle both sides of the brain with the sciencey stuff, but then also I'm just, I've always been a really creative dude. And so this uh, event scratches that itch quite, quite well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's primarily that, like you're saying, and, and you, you said it quite well, it's, it's intentionally and not to be antagonistic. And I really hope that that's understood. Like, it's not that these topics that are well addressed are not valid. They're absolutely valid. Absolutely. All the, you know, the citizen science, the DNA stuff, we, we're even going to have, I didn't even mention that we're actually going to have a whole Michael Blitz tent and somebody genetically mm -hmm. sequencing and IDing, and like, we're going to have that represented and, and hyping that up and fundus the the nonprofit in North America trying to sequence and identify fungi they're represented at the event like absolutely that gets a place but they're it's not the focus it's not like the yeah like you say we're, we're it's really intentional to try to because we only have a few days we only have so much time like let's spend it and we only do it every other year like let's just push the boundaries as much as we can creatively uh, in an in welcoming open way well and the other thing i like about that approach is ever so i got a little discord server i named it the round table because i wanted everybody to feel important and equal i didn't want there to be this expert versus newbies and all this stuff you're, you're doing the exact same thing you're saying well the scientists matter but so does the the dude who like collects dyer's polypores and makes afghans out of them and so does the person who's creating art out of you know morphological like fungus morphology and stuff you're just giving everybody who has an interest in mushrooms a place at the table and a chance to share the way in which they love fungi. I, I love that, man. That's that's absolutely the right way to go about it because that's how the world works. The no, world they, they, is huge and diverse. It's in lockstep, you know? It's like the science discovers a thing, then the entrepreneur or the innovator or the artist takes that in that insight that that knowledge piece applies it in some way that's public facing because typically academics are not public facing and then they might the the creative or whatever you want to call them um, might come up with a new angle that leads to the scientist who has big science money to do their next research project and next grant round to try to investigate this this hypothesis that the artist maybe came up with that of course doesn't always happen but like that's a great synergy and one needs the other. It's like two feet is how I think about it is what I'm doing oh, with yeah. my hands. It's two feet walking down the same path. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... It, it, What's well, like, um, I don't... Do you know about the guy Ernst Henkel? He's this old... Uh, he, he Actually, a lot of scientific illustration, the style comes from this guy. And yeah. He used yeah. to... He, he like discovered protozoa and all this stuff. There's a documentary called Proteus about him. But right back in the day, scientists were also creative. They were also artistic. They had they didn't have cameras and all that. They had to draw everything they saw. So every scientist necessarily had to also be a bit of an artist. And so this disconnection these days, and we see, I work in healthcare, so I see it in healthcare. Everybody's specialized now. So nobody gets the gestalt of the thing. Everybody just has their little piece they're trying to treat, and then the other doctors treating their little piece no one's ever looking at the whole individual and, and the same has happened in science you dude you just nailed it you never know the thing that the the music artist is gonna say to a guy at a party that makes his brain explode an hour later and go oh my god i never thought about it like that yeah yeah i mean reductionism is is one of the uh is the the other side of the double-edged sword of science, science, modern science and the scientific method and scientism as sort of a dogma is you know, smallest part is all that matters and the whole is completely forgotten, right? And I, I, I uh, push myself to, to do that work. I mean, I'm, I've always been a uh, big picture thinker, systems thinker. Um, I've just gotten better at it as I've gotten older, but in retrospect, I used to do it as a kid. It was more creative though. It's like, I'm a poet and I used to make uh, yeah, I write a lot of poetry and actually hip hop and is all about just connecting totally disparate ideas, right? That's meta metaphor and simile and that's fun creatively, but it's a it's, I don't know, way my brain works. And then that, that just naturally applied to mycology. I was like, oh, well, clearly this applies to this other aspect of human history and this notion of psychology. And people are like, we're talking about the Spitzen Corpor. I'm like, but don't you see? <laughs> it's all related. And, and I, I don't know. And so that 
I put into words in my book, and then now I was trying to execute it through lived experiences. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about people love mycology for all kinds of reasons. Some people are better at articulating it than others. Some people don't want to articulate why they like this thing, or they give some one reason when the real reason is a private secret. I don't know. Uh, but regardless, maybe you just don't even know what it is. It's like a feeling. And so we're trying to create these moments as I say, and it's an evolution thing, like, you know, in 2026, we'll do even more stuff. I don't know what it'll be. We'll learn from this one of creating these like, yeah, these stage spaces, we're very proud of them. Um, that's a big piece, some other installations on the property where you go and you're like, Oh, wow, this is, I'm having these feelings in space. And it's clearly related to mycology, but in these ways, I can't place it. And I'm surrounded by 300 other people that are like vibing with me. And we're all sober. This is crazy. <laughs> like, that's what I live for. That's what we all live for on the crew. And it's and it's not just me. I mean, there's like 10 people um, involved in putting this together. I'm telling you, I, I'm I'm not optimistic for, for this one. I'm definitely there in two years. Uh, I'm going to try to twist my wife's arm. I've, I've been traveling a lot this summer. So we'll we'll see if I can I can pull this one out of out of the bag. But man, this is this is amazing. This right. This is first off. If you just want to be really clinical about it, if you're going to host an event, you should know about the other events and you should want to do something a little bit different. I love that you're just like, so this has been done and that's been done. And, and there are, you know, there are events that are all about the forays and there are events that are all about the lectures. I have been to a few of those as well. I love those. I haven't been to one like what you're talking about. You have not been to one that's, bringing more creative energy, more artistic energy into the space. Um, you're, I, I cannot, I cannot wait to hear, hear all about it. We'll, we'll have to do another, uh, we'll have to do another episode, you know, in a few months, just talking the, the download of how it went and, and who inspired you and all that good stuff. Um, do this though, uh, before we go, give people just a taste like who who and this is not to pick favorites you know but but just off the top of your head um give me a handful of presenters that you just can't wait to hear what they have to say well it's easy on on the website we have featured speakers and these are you know the the predominant phds and authors so they're the the bigger names um so i'll just focus on them because that's easier and, and feels feels more balanced or fair i guess um so I mentioned Gerald Pollack, author of Fourth Phase of Water, modern uh, water wizard. If people are familiar with Victor Schauberger, he was like the Tesla of water 100 years ago, and Gerald Pollack kind of falls on his heels. I don't know, water's wild. And we got Gerald, so that's amazing. Um, Christopher Hobbs, as I mentioned, he was there in 2022. He was in the costume contest. He's a danceaholic. He's a great guy. Happy to have him back. Just a wonderful human. And he'll be teaching you know, deep knowledge around medicinal mushrooms intermediate slash advanced classes on preparation of uh, products. Um, we have Siri Robinson or Sari Robinson, professor at university or Oregon State University expert on spalted wood. So these are fungi that stain wood colors. So Sari will be talking about like three back to back, like masterclass, basically a, in one day, back to back workshops, how to find these fungi in the wild. They're, they're usually crust fungi, so a little more eclectic how to apply them to wood and stained wood and make your own spalted fancy wood and then how to turn or like cut the wood and make objects out of it. So like, that's amazing. And they were, Sari was there last time as well. Everybody loves Sari, so we're bringing Sari back. Um, and then Kevin Feeney, I haven't actually mentioned, Kevin Feeney wrote the book Fly Agaric, came out a few years ago. That's where my, my research on Bridget is written about in. And this is the book on that mushroom, kind of everything you need to know. He's a professor up in Washington. And so he'll be doing two talks on fly agaric, uh, historical and contemporary uh, approaches and applications of that mushroom. It's food, is medicine, obviously psych psychedelics. So we do, we, if we talk about psychedelics, it's actually more about Amanita. Again, because Amanita just, it's like, it feels like old hat because it's like the most cliche mushroom. But actually for me, it's the most fascinating mushrooms out of, out of all of them. And, and the uh, implications of mucemol and all these things is quite interesting to me. Mostly because psilocybin is talked about everywhere else. So let's talk about mucemol. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, um, you, I, I'm with you cause we've talked about it on this show. Some, if I got somebody on the show that wants to talk about Amanita muscari, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. shut my mouth. Let's hear all about it. Yep. So, so yeah, Kevin will be there. He was also there in 2022. 
wonderful guy. Um, yeah, and then we have, you know, 20 plus other, we have a guy coming from Palestine talking about micro-remediation of all of production waste all the way from Palestine. We have, we have an expert Japanese shiitake log grower come from Japan, talk about his 15-year-old business um, and, and all the implications of log harvesting in, in Japan. Um, we have a teacher come from Ireland who is giving a few different talks on wild food preparations and Amanita muscaria uh, processing. And then we have a ton of teachers from around North America. Basically, those so those are internationals, which is pretty pretty amazing folks, and then uh, some some big authors, and then myself. I'm doing uh, microscopy three, three talks, right? Yeah. Okay. What is what's the third one? The third one is on um, I'm calling it the mysteries of mycology. So a little potpourri of a bunch of the eclectic weird things. I'll, I'll spend a good chunk breaking down the the water and hyphal extension quandary as a lead up to Gerald, who will follow me uh, in the schedule but a bunch of other just random, crazy, weird stuff about uh, mycorrhizae and all kinds of cool things about fungi. Um, I'll also be doing the, the keynotes uh, address Thursday, opening up the event. And that's where we're going to talk. I'll get really deep into some of the crazy, other crazy water stuff, interesting water stuff. Um, yeah, some other surprises should be really good at the opening. So, and then I'll be around hanging out all weekend. I'm excited this time to, uh, last time, I was just, yeah, we were still ironing out the kinks, I guess you could say. So behind the scenes was super busy. This year we learned, we ironed out um, almost all the kinks. Those are always going to be kinks. But I'm super excited to just be relaxing a lot more and hanging out with folks. So people can catch me. I'm super approachable, happy to chat about whatever. So we can hang out. We've got four days. All right, guys, you heard it. Right, September 26th through the 29th, right? It's the last weekend yeah. of September. Yeah. Uh, up in Oregon. Now, how far outside of Portland are you? It is the it's basically 30 minute straight shot south. Super easy okay. to get there. We have camping on site, car camping on site, tent campings included with the multi day pass. There's uh, food is also served on the property. The the farm, it's like local. So I didn't even mention the farm, Brown Bottle Farm. They have, they, they are commercial mushroom growers, kind of mm -hmm. smaller scale. They're going to do a tour of their whole setup, no secrets, you know, everything exposed. So you get a full tour of a, of a functional commercial mushroom farm. And then they're going to be selling their mushrooms and produce and, and other local food through the eatery with burgers and pizza. There's a menu on the website. That's a whole other piece of the event. Um, yeah. So, and it's 40 acres, about half of it's developed, half of it is third growth forest. So there's mushrooms. We do forage. Uh, there is some picking that happens. And we have the ID table and all the mushrooms found on site that are brought to the table, get sequenced and put into an uh, online database for, to support fundus. Love it. All right, man. Well, so everybody watching, uh, if you don't have anything going on uh, last weekend in September and, and you're, you know, within a day's drive of roughly Portland, Oregon. OK, that's where I would be. I know that I, I got a couple of friends in Portland. I'm going to have to give them a call and be like, what you guys doing the last weekend of uh, of September? So ho hopefully we'll get a few people out there because I need I need some reconnaissance. I need them to come back and tell me, I can't believe you missed this. This was so amazing. Uh Anyway, uh, glad to have you here. Uh, we definitely have to do this again. I I, I want to hear how it went. Um, and, and I would love to get it more in depth in, in some of the topics, especially from the book and just more new things, right? Like, man, you were around when it wasn't even cool yet to, to like mushrooms. And now it's cool. And so, you know, there's some new stuff we can talk about. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. This is this was really great. I, I, I had... And in the back of my mind going, there's going to be a right time to have Peter on and, and to reach out to him and be like, I want to have you on the show now. And this was great. I heard about the event. I said, oh, this event looks so cool. I'm really getting into meeting people. There's nothing better than hanging out with people who like mushrooms as much as you do. I, I know I'm already preaching to the choir. <laughs> well, I, I, I love that experience so much. I put together a big event yeah. to do that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Well, I hope it goes well. Uh, I really hope that you don't have to worry about the logistics and you can spend more time just being present and enjoying all your hard work. Um, I think it's great that you found a kind of a home base. I think only good things will come from that. And every year it's just going to be a more and more well oiled machine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the last thing I can say is definitely I feel blessed to uh, have you know, found Brown Bottle Farm, Anna and Ryan, who are the stewards, are kindred spirits. They get it. They are down. 
they are down for everything. All my crazy ideas, they are 100% with me. It's it's synergistic, like you can't believe. So it's it's a great space and they're wonderful people. That's awesome. Cool, man. Well, uh, you know, get your sleep, get ready. I mean, it sounds like you've just crafted this whole thing. I mean, you're even thinking about how your keynote's going to lead into this this talk and in the stages and the space. I mean, it just sounds like it, it's a whole you've created a new living organism and and I can't can't wait to hear how it goes. Thanks man. I, f- I feel I feel seen by you MG. Thank you very much. Thanks Appreciate man. That. So I, I want to see everybody. I you know I got my glasses on so. All right. Yeah. Cool man. Well, we'll take care and we'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you. All right guys. That was Peter McCoy. Looks like a lot of fun. If you guys are over uh, roughly near Portland, Washington State, anywhere around there, uh, and you don't have anything going on the last weekend of September, that's probably what I'd be doing. Um, Ticket prices are super affordable. It looks like he pulled out all the stops. It's going to be an unforgettable weekend. So if if, if somebody go, come back so you can tell me how awesome it was. I want to hear all the stories. Anyway, um, so let me see. I'm hoping I'm going to have an episode next Monday. It's probably going to be a live. Um, you know, I'm going to be at the Ohio Mushroom Festival all weekend. When I get back, I'm probably not going to have time to to throw anything together. So let's just go ahead and say that'll be a live. We'll, we'll probably cover some of the festival. Maybe I'll have made a couple of friends we can bring on the show and chit chat with. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll come up with some. We'll, we'll see what we can do. And until then, go grow some mushrooms. Oh,